I want to welcome everybody here today, uh, remind you to silence your phones or put them on um, airplane mode so that the people on Zoom can hear well. Um, this has been a great week, great Thanksgiving week. If you had a really good Thanksgiving, say amen. amen. Wow. That was louder than I expected the Quakerly voices to be on saying amen. <laughs> Um, I just want to welcome everybody here. Uh, time for the opening hymn, which is in worship and song number 19. Well, it's been a busy week. It's been a busy month. Um, as a matter of fact, it's rather busy for me and Mike because last week we celebrated our 54th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and then 
next month on the 21st of December is my 72nd birthday. And I do like nice jewelry, so just saying, you know. <laughs> well, I'm going to be 72, but whenever I grow up, I want to be a Streetlmire. <laughs> and I don't care which one. It can be Cindy or it can be Mark, or it can also be um, uh, Sandra. Because those three can get up here and act like they're just so confident and they're not nervous at all. And that's not me. I'm a nervous Nelly. But I'm working on it because I want to improve. And improvement can be good. And improvement can be a good thing when one's trying to improve himself, not out of jealousy over another one's gifts or abilities and is not willing to bring somebody else down in order to elevate oneself. Nobody illustrates this point about self-aggrandizing better than Dr. Seuss. I love Dr. Seuss. So please bear with me while I read to you the wisdom of Dr. Seuss in the story of Gertrude McFuzz. <clears throat> There once was a girl bird named Gertrude McFuzz, and she had the smallest plain tail ever was. One droopy droop feather, that's all that she had. And oh, that one feather made Gertrude so mad. For there was another young bird that she knew, a fancy young birdie named Lala Lilu. And instead of one feather behind, she had two. Poor Gertrude. Whenever she happened to spy Miss Lolly Lou flying by in the sky, she got very jealous. She frowned and she pouted. And then one day she got awfully mad and she shouted, This just isn't fair. I have one. She has two. I must have a tail like Lolly Lou. So she flew to her uncle, a doctor named Drake, whose office was high in a tree by the lake, and she cried, Uncle Doctor, oh please do you know of some kind of a pill that will make my tail grow? Tut, tut, said the doctor, such talk, how absurd. Your tail is just right for your kind of a bird. Then Gertrude had tantrums. She raised such a din that the finally her uncle, the doctor, gave in, and he told her just where she could find such a pill, on a pillberry vine on the top of a hill. Oh, thank you, Chirp Gertrude McFuzz, and she flew right straight to the hill where the pillberry grew. Yes, there was the vine, and as soon as she saw it, she plucked off a berry, and she started to gnaw it. It tasted just awful, almost made her sick, but she wanted that tail, so she swallowed it quick. Then she felt something happen. She felt a small twitch, as if she had been tapped down behind by a switch. And Gertrude looked around, and she cheered it was true. Two feathers, exactly like Lala Lilu. Then she got an idea. Now I know what I'll do. I'll grow a tail better than Lala Lilu. These pills that grow feathers are working just fine. So she nibbled another one off of the vine. She felt a new twitch, and then Gertrude yelled, Hey, Miss Lala only has two, and I have three. When Lolly Lou sees this beautiful stuff, she'll fall right down flat on her face, sure enough. I'll show her who's pretty. I certainly will. Why, I'll make my tail even prettier still. She snatched at those berries that grew on the vine. She gobbled down four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and she didn't stop eating young Gertrude McFuzz till she had eaten three dozen. That's all that there was. Then the feathers popped out with a zang, with a zing. They blossomed like flowers that bloom in the spring. 
all fit for a queen. What a sight to behold. They sparkled like diamonds and gumdrops and gold, like silk, like spaghetti, like satin, like lace. They burst out like rockets all over the place. They waved in the air and they swished in the breeze, and some were as long as the branches of trees, and still they kept growing. They popped and they popped until long about sundown when finally they stopped. And now, giggled Gertrude, the next thing to do is to fly straight home and show Lala Lilu. And when Lala sees these, why, her face will get red and she'll let out a scream and she'll fall right down dead. Then she spread out her wings to take off from the ground. But with all of those feathers... She weighed 90 pounds. She yanked and she pulled and she let out a squawk, but that bird couldn't fly, couldn't run, couldn't walk. And all through that night, she was stuck on that hill. And Gertrude McFuzz might be stuck up there still. If her good Uncle Dake hadn't heard the girl yelp, he rushed to her rescue and brought along help. To lift Gertrude up almost broke all their beaks, and to fly her back home it took almost two weeks, and then it took almost another week more to pull out those feathers. Whew, Gertrude was sore. And finally, when all the pulling was done, Gertrude behind her again just had one. That little one feather she had as a starter but now that's enough because now she is smarter. So once again, it's important and it's good to improve yourself as long as we don't try to do it on the backs of others. Depending on our motor, motive, like Gertrude McFuzz, maybe it might be better sometimes to sat be satisfied with the way we was. And now it's time for announcements, and we will start with the people on Zoom. Okay, now we'll move to here. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm Randy Horton, and I think most of you know that I'm the presiding clerk here at Fairfield, so I feel like I owe you some explanation. Um, we've been at Fairfield well over 20 years, and I don't, although we haven't attended every monthly meeting, uh, won't pretend to say that. Uh, I don't remember it ever being canceled. So last Sunday, um, I was really forced to, a week ago, uh, have a broken rib, is what's happened. And uh, this time, a week ago, if I coughed or sneezed, I experienced pain that absolutely made me howl. Um, Becky will testify to in our guests from Virginia witness and had to experience that. Um, at any rate, um, it was done by a chiropractor last Thursday. Um, I had a, a, a problem which he did fix but in the process broke my rib. Um, the moral of the story really is uh, you got to go easy on older folks. 
<laughs> in spite of the way I behave, I really, but, uh, Rita, I am 72 is okay. Um, I can testify to that. Um, anyway, uh, I recommend against chiropractors, I guess, now. I won't return. Um, they he used to make me feel good, but we made a mistake. Anyway, that's all I can tell you. Yeah. should have just had him handed me the microphone. Anyway, update on Kunat. Uh, Tuesday the 13th, Nita, Steve, Randy, and I caravan down to Kunat, and we took all the food that you had collected, and Mabel was grateful to have it. I talked to her yesterday. Uh, they fed 120 families. They bagged and distributed food, the, the uh, Thanksgiving things for 120 families. I did find out, in which we will probably do this next year, she could have used help putting the bags together and distributing them. So, and, but I found this out Tuesday before she was going to do it, Saturday, and you know, we were busy, and I had talked to Phil. He was too. So next year, I'm going to add that little volunteer piece to uh, along with collecting the food. The bad news is, <clears throat> yesterday morning at about 4.40, I'm going to put this delicately, an impaired 21-year-old driver crashed into the shed where all her food is stored. It wrecked two refrigerators, the freezer that they had in there. Um, no one was hurt, including the driver. Um, probably was out joyriding, and I said impaired. Mabel has insurance, so her insurance agent will be there on Monday. And she, she guaranteed that, she yes, the shed was covered, everything that was damaged was covered, but they're still going to need help. So, and she asked for our prayers. So that's what I'm asking for now, and I ask her to keep me informed as to what was going on and if there was anything else we could do. So let's pray for Mabel and Kunat Food Pantry. <clears throat> Jim? <clears throat> Hi, this is Don Adams, and uh, I had advice for Randy is to find somebody who does acupuncture. <laughs> I've never had a broken anything with a pin, but uh, we're glad to have you back, Randy. My announcement is brief. Uh, we have a Writers Club this afternoon at 1 o'clock. It's over here in the um, Writers Group, whatever we call that room, conference room. And uh, it's always a joy to be with a bunch of folks that like to play with pens and paper, so <coughs> we have a wonderful uh, time and future. Thank you. I'm Ellen Blackader, and um, on behalf of the Caring Friends Committee, we'd like to remind you that next Sunday is your last uh, day to donate for our chair bags, holiday chair bags. So if you um, have anything you know, you'd like to donate, bring it and put it in the conference room. And we are doing 20 this year. So thank you. As long as we're announcing next Sunday, next Sunday I will remind you is the famous Snowflake Sunday. And we are having our Christmas, excuse me, our Christmas pitch in uh, after that, the same day. We have traditionally had it the second Sunday after the children's program, but we don't have a children's program this year. So next week is pitch in and snowflake <coughs> Sunday. Hi, my name's Josiah Hostetler. If you'll please join me in prayer. We ask to hold all of these in the light, those that we spoke out loud and those we keep in our thoughts. We know that we are all held, no matter what we are experiencing in this moment, from those that are healing, those of us feeling alone, 
those who are rejoicing or those of us simply waiting for something. We ask for the strength of knowledge to ask for forgiveness from others and to forgive ourselves. We give thanks for those that prepared this place for us to meet and everything that comes our way from the food that others prepare to the hands of the professionals that care for us. We see the light around us through a smiling face, the birds and the animals, and simply know that we are loved as much. Help us to bring peace to bear that surpasses all understanding. Amen. And now if we could have a couple of volunteers uh, to collect food for the needy. I was asked to speak about my work in the interfaith community today. So hopefully this will be insightful, if not uh, too dry. My professional background is in social work and medical education, so I'll try not, not make this too academic either. Um, however, an academic framework has served me well in my work this past year as the program director at Center for Interfaith Cooperation. Um, but before I get into talking a little bit more about this framework and reflecting on my more recent experiences, I'll back up to tell you a little bit about how I ended up here. My father is a pastor in the Church of the Brethren, one of the three historic peace churches, along with friends and Mennonites. I was born in Kansas, but my father was called to a church in Dallas Center, Iowa for eight years then in Keene, New Hampshire, for a year of new church development, and finally settling in northern Indiana in Bremen. I was nine by the time we moved to Bremen, and I lived there until I went to college. If you had traveled through Bremen in the 90s or early 2000s, you would have seen a sign that welcomed you to town, advertising several years of football state championships, the home of former Governor Otis Bowen, and the Holy Walk. We are getting to that time of year uh, of preparation for the Holy Walk, and I'm sure it continues to this day. It is an entire recreation of Bethlehem on the night of Jesus' birth, out in the middle of the field and woods next to a small pond, which runs a weekend in December. The entire religious community in Bremen uh, participated in staffing and provided this outdoor spectacle. And throughout the time that I lived there, I was a fisherman, a cheesemonger, an apple seller, a carpenter, behind the scenes help. Let me tell you, long underwear, a down jacket, and tunic were not always enough to ward off the northern Indiana winter weather, but we canceled for no one. The show must go on. If you were a participant, the process for the entire experience started in the high school gym, where different singing groups and bands from across the area performed, mostly Christian uh, music, but some more secular holiday tunes as well. From there, you would uh, board a bus out to the Huff Farm 
and a guide would explain this time travel and the decree from Caesar that all families must return to their place of birth and pay taxes for the census. Once you get off the bus, you meet some shepherds with rumors of a messiah. From there, the inn with no room, fishermen, angels, Roman soldiers, and the regular town folk of Bethlehem. In the middle of this recreated town was a large tent meant to embody the tribes of Israel. It was a curious and bizarre amalgamation of things that Midwestern Christians knew about Judaism in the time of Jesus. A, claim, a woman claiming to be Rachel from the house of David. Children invited to make and spin dreidels despite not knowing what that meant. You could even try your hand at copying Hebrew from passages of the Torah, in, again, not understanding a single letter. Uh, back out into the little town your group would go and run in with some Roman soldiers and then the town folk uh, who would ask you questions about where you came from. The skit would go on from there and you would not believe who came in droves to experience this, the Amish. They love the fact that they were way more technologically sophisticated than these poor town folk from Bethlehem. My brother, being particularly cunning, would go off with one of his friends from youth group and wrap himself in head to toe in scarves so that only his eyes would be showing. Then his friend would approach a group of travelers and ask if there were any young unmarried men that looking to be wed. His friend would then barter with them about livestock and agree to marry him off. They did not know he was male, so my brother would bring back stories about all the Amish men that had agreed to marry him that evening. <laughs> the holy walk would end with a real still life nativity scene with different people playing Mary, David, and the baby Jesus. Many children in Bremen were Jesus and they didn't even know it. From there would be another tent with the pastors from town who would take an hour each and ask people to reflect on their experience. Some, like my father, were more interested in hearing from those that came through, but others had a more evangelical bent. Finally, the group would be taken through the hot cocoa and cookie line in the barn and back on the bus to modern day. Even though I didn't know it at the time, this was my first interfaith experience. My second, more formal interfaith experience was shortly after in middle school, when my father one summer decided that instead of Sunday school, we would go to different churches and a synagogue to experience Christian history. It was my first time interacting with real Judaism, and I found the faith something deep meaningful and something that I had not experienced in my own faith tradition. Questions were not only welcome, but expected. After the tour, we had a session called Stump the Rabbi, where my Sunday school classmates asked the obvious questions about Jesus, and where I learned a lot more about Jesus' Jewish upbringing and faith. It was from that experience that I truly started to question the world around me and know that there was more than just the unique experience and theology in the Church of the Brethren where I had grown up. This brings me to the guidelines that I had mentioned earlier and that I learned from Dr. Diane Moore's edX Religious Literacy, Traditions and Scriptures course, which is free to audit online. I tell myself prior to any faith experience these three things. One, <clears throat> Each faith has the right to express their orthodoxy, right belief, and orthopraxy, right practice. However, know that others have the right to their own orthodoxy and orthopraxy that is contradictory to that. Two, culture and religion are inherently linked. Culture informs religion, and religion informs culture. It is hard to sometimes differentiate the two, and anyone who goes into a faith setting which which they are unfamiliar should expect that they will not understand where one begins and one ends. 
Three, given that culture and religion are constantly informing each each other, both are constantly changing. Visiting one faith community one year might yield a completely visit, different visit 10 years from then. These guidelines have given me the ability to navigate spaces that I thought I would never be able to bring myself to go into. They give me a layer of steadfast appreciation for the other but keep my own belief system intact. Indeed, I have a, ha, <coughs> had a deep personal reservation about being a gay, peace-loving Christian going into spaces that I, may, that I know may even preach against what I believe. However, I know that they can believe that, and I can believe what I believe, and we can both, or neither, change our minds. I've had plenty of opportunity in this job to experience other faith traditions as well. From visiting mosques, Hindu temples, central Indiana, synagogues, gurdwaras, churches, and meetings, retreats, and prayer spaces for many other faiths, for the emerging interfaith leaders group, our 14 to 24 year olds. We are just in the middle of a fall series of visits now and I will be going to Masjid al muminin this afternoon. Last week, a group of Hindu students visited the Sikh Gudwara, and being the only non-Indian descendant there was an honor and a privilege to watch this dialogue happen in real time. A lot of it in Punjabi, which I did not understand, but everyone else did, and that was the point. If you read the international news, you would think this as an impossibility. But in truth, these interactions happened every day. We are just not aware of them. That is the point of one of our other programs, the Interfaith Enrichment Corps. We have AmeriCorps members in ages 18 to 75 in our cohort. Interfaith Enrichment Corps members spend six months or up to a year serving their community in faith communities or organizations serving faith communities in exchange for interfaith, nonprofit, and workforce development training, a biweekly stipend, and an education award. The National AmeriCorps Office has just recognized the Interfaith Enrichment Corps as a civic bridge building organization in the efforts of members have been doing over the last 11 years of the program. Indianapolis has been known as the city of churches, but I think it is time to consider the wonderful diversity of the face of those that we interact with every day. I've been participating in an association of religious data archives group on their community profiler, which you can find online at arda.com. Through this, I learned one of the largest growing faiths outside of the Latino Catholic community is Islam in Indianapolis. The, in Indy, the Muslim population has grown fourfold in the last 10 years. Therefore, we have used this data to inform programming at CIC and have increased the number of Muslim members as well as sites in our Interfaith Enrichment Corps. Beyond these dedicated programs, uh, Center for Interfaith Cooperation has yearly programming from our Interfaith Banquet, which is, will be held in April this year, uh, to our Festival of Faith, which is held every September. To bring this to a close, although not all of my experience in new faith settings are positive, and some have been negative, I do have the opportunity to learn about others and myself through them. I find a common theme in all of these traditions. And so I know that some of you come from different faith traditions and have also had negative experiences in them, but I take it as a total package. As Quakers, we are called to find the light in others. In Hindu, namaste, the God in me greets that of God in you. In Muslim and Sikh traditions, all are born naturally into the faith. They only have to state it. 
The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe there is that of Jesus in particular in every human alive. We just have to find it. And of course, many pagans believe we are one with creation, and that sentiment goes into other faith traditions as well. It is not always an easy walk, but it is worth it. One of my favorite songs is Simple Gifts, but explains this walk well in its last line. True simplicity is gained. To bow and to bend, we shall not be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. It's time for our closing um, hymn, which is number 22 in um, Worship and Song. Stand if you're able. Thank you. 
Go with a desire to learn and walk in the light. Be the light for someone this week and ask a caring question. Go and think of your neighbor and bring peace. Turn and greet friends.